Roger, I, like you, have been fascinated with consciousness my whole life, and I, like you, did my early training in neuroscience. What do you feel when you hear some philosophers say that consciousness is just an illusion? Well, I understand completely because that's exactly what I believed at one stage. I was like you, actually, uh, trained as a hardcore neuroscientist. I did my work on brains. I analyzed brains, and I pretty much thought that that, was, that explained it all. And then a couple of things happened to me, and my worldview changed. One thing was I went into psychiatry and, of course, found that there are, there are social and cultural and inner, inner subjective factors that are crucial. And there, but what really turned my world around was beginning to explore a meditative practice. And as I turned attention inward and began to explore consciousness subjectively, directly, I came to feel that there was much more to this extraordinary phenomenon than I'd seen in any neurology textbook. And I began to appreciate the wisdom that we're all heirs to from the great uh, contemplative traditions and began to explore those. And you, you've kept both sides of your mental life very active. Your science side, trained as a neuroscientist, psychiatry, as well as your inner contemplative side. So do you find those uh, warring against each other? Well, I certainly did at first. I found it a very difficult marriage. How on earth do you fit the latest data from neuroscience uh, about the brain and our understanding of, say, for example, psychology and psychological defenses together with the, uh, the treasure trove of uh, ancient wisdom and contemplative wisdom that has come more from subjective inner exploration. And at first I couldn't see how they fitted together. And it's literally been a three-decade quest to begin to see how they do fit together and how they actually complement one another. The argument is that we have these different sensations um, that we know, vision and hearing and our special senses and everything else, and they all feed in. And this part of the brain called the reticular activating system, which is in the lower part of the brain that sends signals that tells us what to focus on and what to concentrate on, uh, gives us the impression that we are this wholly unified kind of person, when in reality we're just focusing on one thing at a time, and we have this, these multiple things, and, and uh, it's just a kind of a mechanical process. Yeah, and I think if you only look at the mechanics, if you only look at the neurons, then of course that's the only thing you'll take account of. Uh, so I think, it, and it's obviously clear that consciousness is intimately related to the brain. If you, you know, bust up a brain, you don't uh, see a lot of consciousness left. So there's clearly that intimate relationship. And yet, on the other side, we have a great tradition of inner explorers who tell us that Actually, when you look very carefully, directly at consciousness, you find something else. You find that consciousness itself is creative and that it has enormous creative powers. Now, each of us knows that in our direct experience because every night we fall asleep and we literally create worlds. And during our dreams, we seem to be living in a world which is completely solid, which is this bo the dream body seems as real as this one. Our experience seems absolutely convincing. There seem to be other people interacting with us. So we know that our minds can literally create absolutely convincing worlds. Well, one of the extraordinary implications of the world's contemplative traditions is they're saying, well, hey, this world too is actually to a significant extent a mind creation. So the challenge we seem to face is how to bring these two streams of knowledge together. And it seems to me that any true quest for wisdom and for knowledge really has to be willing to look at all the information we have, all the data, both from those who have spent years exploring internally 
and those who are exploring the brain, the body, physics, all the mechanistic information that we now have. Many scientists would agree with you, but look upon consciousness more as, uh, oh, maybe a process for controlling our autonomic nervous system, uh, but not putting any real substance that this is some independent reality, but rather just the, uh, uh, the, the, the output of the, uh, of the neurons the way um, urine is the output of the kidneys. Yes, and I think that, as with so many questions, the answers you get depend on how you examine the question. And if you only examine the neurons and so forth, then would you expect to find anything more? So the, really it seems to me that the question is, how do we use as many approaches as possible? How do we use neuroscientific data? How do we use cultural studies? Because culture clearly affects consciousness. How do we look at social structures? Because socioeconomic factors determine consciousness also. And then how do we look internally and combine two great worlds of subjective exploration, both the contemporary psychological and psychotherapeutic explorations of people, starting with Freud, who systematically looked within, let's say, psychological defense mechanisms. And how do we combine that with the contemplative spiritual explorers who've used meditation, yoga, contemplation for centuries to explore the mind? The argument is that these people, though, were pre-scientific and that they may be doing something, but that we can just analyze what they're doing in terms of the behavioral response or the, or the uh, physiological response and that there's no independent reality to that. But, but you would disagree with that. So I, I want to dig deeper into your understanding of consciousness and why you think that, that most scientists who would reduce consciousness to pure brain function are missing something. Well... <clears throat> First off, I think we need to understand that any worldview, under, any understanding of reality can be used to interpret other people's uh, accounts of things as little fragments of yours <laughs> and as distorted understandings. If they just understood things correctly, then they'd see it my way. So that's, I think we have to take that as a presupposition. Then as to my personal understanding, uh, I, let me speak very personally and simply Please. say that... I, I was shocked when I took up meditation. I was a hardcore materialist, and yet the deeper I went in meditation, the more I began to see in my own direct experience its creative powers, its potentials, and its capacity for creating apparently all-encompassing worlds, which seemed completely real. And so I have to take the perennial arguments for the creative power of consciousness and the fact that we usually underappreciate that power very seriously. Roger, you've put your scientific training, your psychiatric training to work analyzing these different forms of consciousness, even comparing it to schizophrenia. Yes, I think one of the, one of the opportunities we now have is that for the first time in history, we have an enormous array of understandings or information about different states of consciousness. One of the things that has happened in our culture over the last few decades is that we've gone from what the anthropologists call a monophasic culture, that is a, co a culture which appreciates only one state of consciousness, our usual waking state, we are beginning to become a polyphasic culture, a culture which appreciates the value of multiple states such as dreaming or meditation or yoga or contemplation. And having opened up to that, we've begun to appreciate that actually consciousness is, is extraordinarily plastic, that there are states of consciousness available to us that we really didn't know about, that people can develop states of, for example, extreme concentration or calm and peace or clarity, so that consciousness can be cultivated and developed in various ways. So then, of course, one of the big questions becomes, well, just how many states are there? How do we map them? And just as there's this extraordinary project going on now, the Human Genome Project, trying to understand the array of genetic elements in our makeup, one of the great projects of our time is also the Human Consciousness Project. What, are the, what is the array of states of consciousness that a human being can access? 
which ones are valuable, what are useful, for what purpose, and how do we cultivate them? Are they sufficiently different to, to allow <laughs> that as opposed to some just artificial distinction between people who are sort of half this period of reverie between sleep and wakefulness? Are you really talking about uh, distinctions with the difference? Well, I think uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, <coughs> No, in that definitely some states of mind shade into others. When we fall asleep, for example, all of us know we get a little quieter and calmer and, and things get beautifully still and relaxed and then we wake up. <laughs> so there's a whole shade of changes that occur as we fall asleep. On the other hand, there are some very clear, dis discrete states. There are, for example, among meditators, some states in which they attain extraordinary degrees of calm and they can deliberately shift to states of, uh, say, great equanimity or stability where the mind doesn't move at all, states of great, uh, great, great concentration. So clearly there are some states which can be very clearly demarcated, and that's one of the challenges of our time, along with the challenge of finding just how much the mind can be trained. And in this process, do you find yourself sensing that consciousness is has more of an independent reality or a derivative reality? Well, I wrestle with that question. I have certainly come more towards an independent state. But what you're really getting at is what's the relationship between consciousness and matter? And of course, as you know better than <laughs> almost anyone, that's one of the great questions of our time, the so-called hard problem. And I don't have a definitive answer. What I can tell you is that as a result of both 30 years of intense personal exploration, which I've spent literally years in retreat doing these contemplative practices very intensely and systematically myself, and as a result of studying everything from ancient uh, spiritual and contemplative texts to looking at the current research on meditation, where I come out is that consciousness has much greater power, much greater uh, plasticity and certainly seems more independent than our contemporary scientific research assumes. What methodologies do you use to characterize these different states of consciousness? Well, several. Uh, first off, as a first step, simply sitting down and talking to people who have experienced them and drawing them out, doing so basically doing interviews. Secondly, uh, as another subjective approach, is to look at classical descriptions of some of these states. Go back to basic texts describing different states of consciousness and analyze them along various characteristics. Are people describing states of intense peace? Are they describing concentration? And as much as we can measure those so we can develop a what's called a phenomenological, meaning an experiential map of the different states. And then, of course, ideally, we like to correlate those with physiological studies, perhaps EEG studies, looking at the electrical brain activity, and where possible, begin to get a convergent picture of information that dovetails and gives us a multi-dimensional picture of these states. Do you ever find different EEG patterns between states like of intense concentration and intense calm? Oh, yes. <clears throat> yes, although I have to say that the research is pretty much, uh, it's just beginning, and I think this is one of the great questions that's going to occupy us for several decades, mapping out as precisely as possible the, the subtleties of neuro, neurological and uh, electrophysiological differences between these brain states. Uh, at this stage, the instrumentation is a little primitive. We're talking about very subtle states of mind and advanced stages of development, and as yet, we're only just developing the ways to measure those.